Good morning, saints of our Lord, and welcome to Thy Strong Word. I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for tuning us in this morning on Worldwide KFUO, Christ for you anytime, anywhere. A blessed Lent to all of you this Monday, March the 7th, as the light of Christ shines on us from Matthew chapter 20. We just finished the parable of the laborers in the vineyard on Friday. We're greatly blessed as Pastor Heimbach and I went through that, where we see a generous God to his people in Christ. And now we see it in action, that Jesus is not just a savior, but he is a servant who hears the cry of the two blind men, patiently teaching um, the mother. And we hear these words over and over, Lord, have mercy on us. What does this mean for us? We'll dig in today and we shall see. So open up your Bibles, put on your Christ goggles for the gifts are ready, ready for you. Thank you to our friends at Lutheran Heritage Foundation for your support of Thy Strong Word. Visit lhfmissions.org for more information, lhfmissions.org. Helping us to be strengthened by God's Word, God's word this morning, we welcome Pastor Martin Schulteis of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Baltimore, Maryland and also Executive Director of Faith and Work Enterprises, also in Baltimore, Maryland. Pastor Schulteis, happy Lent and welcome to Thy Strong Word. Thank you so much, Pastor Fenner. It's good to be with you. How's, how's the weather in Minnesota? Are they signed to spring yet? <laughs> it, you know what? I tell you what. When it gets to 30 degrees, all of a sudden the birds start chirping, everyone starts wearing shorts outside, and we get excited. How about that? <laughs> that sounds good. We're about ready to get up to 70 something. So we're thrilled. <laughs> well, uh, thanks be to God and Lord have mercy, I think connects on that one. But Pastor, <laughs> this is our first time together. Um, tell us about yourself, your family, and also the unique ministry opportunities that the Lord has given you. Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, again, it's great to be on uh, this program and thanks for the privilege. Uh, been here in Baltimore. I, I grew up for a little bit here in Baltimore. Been here for as a pastor now for going on 18 years at Emmanuel Lutheran Church and School. Fabulous place to do ministry. Uh, we've got a kindergarten through eighth grade school, about 120 ish kids. Um, we've got um, a assistant pastor from Pakistan, uh, Elsie Left Pastor, who uh, does ministry here among Urdu speaking people and also uh, helps out with some uh, ministry in Pakistan. We've got a comfort dog ministry, uh, which is fabulous. Don't give me a hard time. I'm, I'm not the world's biggest dog lover, but I love dog lovers. <laughs> and they have done a wonderful job here, really using the ministry to, to, to reach out to people in need, both in and outside of the congregation. And then uh, we have a ministry uh, and the Faith and Work Enterprises that you mentioned, the nonprofit that we started in Western Baltimore City uh, in the community called Sandtown Winchester, where Freddie Gray was from, uh, who had died, and where there had been tons of unrest. And that is now going on five years uh, old, and it serves the community with crisis care. Uh, work and is about to open. We're about to open a workforce development program in a building that we just purchased there, and doing it all while sharing the the love of Jesus Christ. Family wise, I've got uh, my wife and I have five children: uh, two in college, one in high school, and two first graders here at our school here. So we we've, we've got them all into the spectrum, and we're not sure if the young ones are making us older faster or keeping us young either way we 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 love them <laughs> well good you'll keep them huh you'll keep them no let's get it well your pastor it's a it's a reminder and also for you our listeners a reminder for us to pray for the city as you mentioned there's many burdens and events that cause grief that happens and and there even more so we need to look to the lord who uh, came uh, to serve and not be served, and then therefore we serve in that same mercy. So pray for our cities, pray for the ministries that are there. Uh, we had Pastor uh, uh, Doctor uh, Gerald Gerard Bowling on on Thursday from downtown St. Louis, and had numerous other people who work in the city. So continue to pray for them. But today, Pastor, as in that light of that, we continue um, to be in God's Word. So can you begin our time in prayer? I would love to. Thank you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. 
Oh, Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for this day. Your mercies are new every morning. Your grace is sufficient for us, and you send your spirit upon your people. So, Lord, uh, we cry out to you, not just for ourselves, but for the world around us, wherever there is uh, violence and heartache, pain, and all the troubles of this world, oh, Lord, uh, let us remember you you have been and are one with us, Lord. Uh, indeed, you dwell in us now. Uh, you know our heartaches, O oh Lord, um, and yet you promise to use them and all things for our good. So bless us now as we get into your word and we hear more about uh, the servant God that you are, uh, one who has come to even uh, kneel at our feet uh, to cleanse us and do all things for our sake out of your love. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have any questions concerning our text today or any part of Matthew, send us an email, kfuo at kfuo.org, kfuo at kfuo.org. We'll begin today as reading all of our verses, which is in Matthew chapter 20, beginning in the 20th verse. And as we look at this, in light of this, we had the laborers in the vineyard, and right prior to this, we had Jesus foretelling his death a third time. And Jesus never leaves us. Um, he never leaves us looking at ourselves, is that he continually points us back to himself. So in light of that, we hear these words beginning in verse 20 of Matthew chapter 20, and we'll be reading from the English Standard Version, the Word of God. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say to these two sons of mine, are the son, say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said to him, We are able. He said to them, You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant. But it is for those to, for whom it has been prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the other two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came to be served, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And they went out from, of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent, but they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. This is our reading for today. Pastor, <clears throat> there's, I mean, there's a lot of gems in this. Where do, how do you want to start us off? I, I, yeah, there is. This, is. this is just a fabulous, fabulous text. Um, I, I, I think one of the things is to recognize the context, that this is not just story about a mom and her son or two blind men being healed. But we are just about ready to enter Jerusalem for Holy Week. So we are we are on the cusp of the, the passion, of the suffering, the death, and then the resurrection of our Lord. So these stories do kind of have a heightened meaning uh, to them. But I think what um, strikes me is really looking at them in the context of the, of the whole of Matthew, where we really get um, this, you know, it, Matthew just makes for a great Lutheran gospel. There's so there's law, gospel, law, gospel, law, gospel. And uh, if we don't see that theme in Matthew, then we can kind of get lost in, in some of the other details. Going back to the Sermon on the Mount, there's Sermon on the Mount is beautiful. So much of it can come across as, as law because it's, I mean, if we just look at the Sermon on the Mount as you know ways to live our life, it's going to be rough. Uh, but if we see that as God using it 
to show us what we're not doing and our need, it makes so much more sense. And so you get right after the, and what we're going to see in Matthew is this kind of long gospel, um, like two stories, one after another, happen time and again. Right after the Sermon on the Mount, uh, you get um, Matthew chapter 8, you get the cleansing of the leper, where it, it's almost as though the response to the Sermon on the Mount isn't, okay, Lord, I'm going to go do this, or I'm going to try really hard, uh, but rather the, the leper turns, uh, kneels down before Jesus and says, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And that, after the sermon, that's what that's what we need. That's what we need to say. Um, same thing happens time and time again in Matthew. You get something that sounds like, "Oh man, I'm not, not, I'm not doing it. I can't do it." And then it gets turned around with this gospel welcome approach, which is what we get leading into today's text. If if we just go back to Matthew 19, you get the the beginning. Jesus talking about divorce hard words. I mean, we've got, how many of us have, I mean, we have divorce all around us in our families, in our parishes, uh, in our, in our own lives. And those are harsh words, but it's followed up right away with let the little children come to me. Uh, it's, it's, as, as you mentioned, pastor, uh, that the difference between a salvation that rests on me versus one that rests on him. And, the on me just it always falls short but the on him the welcome is always there There, there's no falling short after after the divorce and then the the children being welcomed then we get the 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 rich the rich man uh the righteous rich man who again wants to bring it on himself and can't i mean what what can he bring to offer um jesus gives him a challenge that he knows the rich man can't do um, followed by the disciples saying, well, then who can be saved? Uh, and, and I would say this is, this is in many ways like the climax of the gospel leading into uh, the Holy Week narrative, who can be saved. And Jesus, of course, says, you know, with man, it's impossible if you haven't learned already. <laughs> you know that already by, by all that's going on. But with God, all things are possible, which then gets followed up with the gospel story of the laborers in the vineyard where the people who hardly did any work at all at the end, all of a sudden they're getting the, 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 the full wages and, and they're getting them first. Yeah. Right. Um, and, <laughs> and then we get that foretelling uh, that you mentioned uh, the third time where Jesus continues to point to them, the difference between what man can accomplish and what he's going to accomplish. He's going to do this. Uh, man, man will kill God. God will serve man. And uh, so we get this one last kind of like a double story before uh, we enter Jerusalem. And we get, you know, mother who's pointing to her sons, sons who are willing to do what needs to be done in order to, you know, I don't know, but, accomplished what they think salvation might might look like and um, not going to be able to do it uh, followed by two blind men who have nothing to say but lord have mercy on us and of course jesus once again shows us the difference between the two i love i love today's account as seen as two stories that are meant to be paired together to help us to understand, you know, law and gospel, uh, you know, with man, it's impossible with God, all things are possible. I think that's, that's the overarching theme. I think we, we want to use when we go into these passages. Well, pastor, all I can say to that is amen. And let's start digging in as we see the merciful Lord who does the impossible for all sinners like you and me. So <clears throat> one thing I have to remind myself as I read this is we can be very critical of those who respond to Jesus, you know? So it's like with Peter, he's kind of like, well, what do we get? You know, we gave up everything and followed you. What do we get? It was so easy for us or the rich man, like you mentioned, so easy for us to read that and go, well, you know, I mean, come on, those guys, they didn't really believe like, like I would have if I was there, but we have our own. I mean, we got to bring our own things to the front. 
to the feet of Jesus in the midst of this too. And I think that's the filter I want to have for personal and for you, our listeners. When we look at the mother's request, too easy to try to throw her under the bus when, you know, let's put ourselves into this and make us realize, what would I be asking Jesus, Jesus if I was walking around with him? So let's get into it here. Verses 20, and I'll go through 21. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say to these two sons of mine, are to sit one at your right and one at your left in your kingdom. So, Pastor, right away, um, it's kind of an awkward exchange. Uh, what's happening? Yeah, it's funny. And I think the, the other gospel doesn't have mom saying it. It has, they maybe was trying to be nicer to the, to, to the boys and it, and it put the question in, in their mouth. But here, here we got, no, it's, it's mom uh, who, who's coming up on, on their behalf. And, and, you know, mom, it sounds like mom's been around and she's been helping and she's been part of um, this movement, if you will, even if, you know, none of them are really aware of, of what this movement is. They have some sense that it has to do with the coming kingdom. And uh, I would say that mom even listened. You know, going back to uh, chapter 19, uh, you know, 13 through 15, you know, the, the children were brought to him that he might lay hands on them, and, and they got rebuked. And he said, no, let the children come. And so that was, you know, that was parents bringing their kids to Jesus. And so mom's now like, oh, okay, you know, I'll bring my kids to Jesus. Uh, they've, they've been here and, and I have my request that, that you bless them in this way, that you, um, that you recognize their willingness to serve you, uh, in this way, even likely to giving their lives. Um, I I think one of the things that we sometimes, uh, don't pick up on is the possible political nature of what's going on. You know, you know, folks were anticipating with the coming kingdom that this son of David would be taking a throne and that you know, this, uh, when, when, when there's a kingdom change, there can be battle with it. Um, there can be, you know, sacrifice with it. And so part of this is saying, you know, John and James, they're, they're willing to go to the end with you. And, and why not? Jesus has already kind of shown you know, you know, special treatment of them with Peter. Uh, so she's just kind of affirming, maybe uh, in many ways, affirming their faith and their willingness to do whatever's needed to, you know, help this mission uh, find success. The theme throughout Matthew, and then this, this really hits home exactly what you said, is that the theme throughout Matthew is this kingdom. And so really, Dr. Gibbs speaks about this, that part of the struggle that, that everyone's having is what does this kingdom look like? And I love the connection you have, let the little ones come to me, that we, there's a certain sense that we have to think that this mother was doing exactly what she thought Jesus said to do is, okay, I bring my sons to you and, and your kingdom is going to be this great kingdom. So make sure they're part of it. And, and as a father and me as a father as well, you want um, one, I know our wives would do this, but also us, we want what's best for our kids. So according to her, she's, I mean, she's doing a very faithful thing, probably no different than what we would do, um, for the good of our children. So that kind of makes me even a little more humbled by the times I've kind of judged her in this story <laughs> because, oh, well, I wouldn't do that, which is probably not true. Any other thoughts on those first two verses, pastor? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, you know, and I think, I think that is the important thing is to recognize and anytime that we look at these biblical figures, um, and think that we would do better then I think we're, we're, we're missing, I think we're missing, uh, the whole, the whole point. This is us. I mean, this is, this is the human, um, this is a human response and it's even a, um, the intention is right on. I mean, they're devoted to the Lord. They're devoted to his kingdom. It doesn't always equal understanding itself. So let's continue on because right now it's just <clears throat> a simple exchange. 
Uh, this is what I'm requesting. So really no different than any of our prayers that we give. And now Jesus starts to respond. Verse 22, Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And they said, we are able. He said to them, you will drink my cup, but to sit on my right hand and my left is not mine to grant, but is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. I'm going to stop there for the moment because it does bring up a term that we need to make sure we have defined, um, the cup. So are you able to drink my cup? Well, yeah, we are. Yeah, you will. So what's up with the cup? I actually I play on words there. What's up with the cup? Go ahead. What's up with the cup? <laughs> yeah, right. And, 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 and the fun thing about the cup is, um, well, I, with with Jesus, you can even get to multiple meanings sometimes, and, and word plays are always fun in uh, Hebrew and Greek literature as well. So we got the cup, and Jesus is, of course, what, what we would understand is the cup that he's about to drink is the cup of the wrath of God, and this is you know what what he's gonna what he's gonna down, if you will, uh, through his. Um, crucifixion for the sake of the world he's going to swallow you know that wrath he's going to he's going to swallow up death itself and um in a, in a sense you know that's the cup that that he's going to drink but he also gives us so this is this is i was just looking at this text this week and i was thinking you know what is he talking about you know you two are gonna you two are gonna drink from the cup that, you know, brings death to you or suffering to you. And, and I think I've looked at that before and we've always struggled that, um, James and John, well, James does die by martyrdom. And so we could say, yeah, death, you know, James joined into that cup, joined into the cross of Christ through his, through his own martyrdom. John tradition has been, uh, wasn't martyred, but died a natural death. We could certainly say that, obviously, you don't need to be martyred to be joined to the cross of Christ. Uh, but but noting that he wasn't. And I'm wondering, and I don't know, Pastor Bender, and you, you have to help me out here if others have done it. I, I wonder if Jesus isn't also alluding to the Eucharistic cup here. Mm-hmm. That the, the cup that I drink, you know, as part of my death, but the cup that I give you is my death. It's, it's my death, um, and I've now shared that with you for the forgiveness of sins. That cup you will drink, um, and so you will join in the benefits of that cup, even as then you join in the work of the Christ through you know your your apostleship and and your sharing of the gospel. I can't I can't disagree. Um, if anybody any of your listeners have a thought on this, send us an email. KFUO at KFUO.org, because while well, they do drink from that cup, so, and, and there is a lot of, uh, the commentaries, like you said, the cup of wrath, but then, like you said, then you have the issue of John doesn't have martyrdom. Um, but still it doesn't mean that he didn't deal with other, uh, uh, persecution, if you will. But right now, I mean, the, the cup, the cup of blessing from the Lord's supper definitely is there as well. But ultimately Jesus says, Hey, listen, yeah, you're going to have that, but this is not for me to grant. This is one of the, one of those spots in scripture where people always ask me the question like, well, well, wait a second here. Um, Jesus is God. So how come he doesn't have that authority? What would you tell them pastor? Well, this, this is the nature. This is, this is like a wonderful, uh, Trinitarian, the Holy Trinity Sunday, uh, <laughs> text, even though it doesn't show up in the lectionary there, right. but, but within the Trinity of God, we, we see the um, characteristics of God that that are that are shown to us for us also within God Himself, and so God reveals Himself as a servant through sending His Son Jesus, who serves us. We shouldn't be surprised that within the Trinity of God, that there's also servantness and obedience. And um, that, that is that played out there as well. And so we see that with Jesus, that even though he may have the right to do something, nonetheless, 
that servant nature of Christ, that um, hum, that humility of Christ shows up even within the relationship of of the Trinity of God. And like you said, that that really <clears throat> brings us to the next portion where Jesus explicitly talks about servanthood, his servanthood and ours as well. But right now we need to take our break. We are studying Matthew chapter 20 with Pastor Martin Schulteis, and we will be right back. Take a look around you. Look closely. Immigrants in the United States and their U.S.-born children now number about 81 million people, or 26% of the population. So chances are, there's someone right in your community who doesn't speak English as a first language and who doesn't know Jesus. The Lutheran Heritage Foundation can help by providing you with free Lutheran books translated into over 90 languages. See their complete list of catechisms and Bible storybooks at lhfmissions.org. And welcome back. We are studying Matthew chapter 20 with Pastor Martin Schulteis of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Baltimore, Maryland, and also Executive Director of Faith and Work Enterprises, also in Baltimore, Maryland. And Pastor, we just got through verse 23, and, and you ended our time looking at the servanthood mentality of this Jesus, who, who for whatever reason doesn't have the right to be able to put people on his right and left hand. And that's not the point, his power and authority, but his servant, not servant heart, but his servant, the servant mentality of the Messiah. So pastor, I want to continue on our time, verse 24, and then go through the end of this narrative in verse 28, verse 24. And when the 10 heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Pastor, I want to just focus on verse 24 right away. Is the other turn, another 10 heard this and they were indignant at the two brothers. What's your thought? Why are they indignant? <laughs> you and I get indignant when, when people do things that, um, gosh, that stand out, frankly, in any way, getting attention that we would rather have or messing up in a way that we think they shouldn't have uh, much as we you're right it's so easy to give everyone a hard time in this whether it's the mother or james and john or the ten. but these are just this is just this is humanity this is reflective of us um they're upset that you know i'm guessing that they're upset that they thought that they would be worthy of this position or um or that or that their mom asked instead of their own mother. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's and, and each of the 10 could have been indignant in different ways, but it's just human nature to kind of be at each other. And we see that time and time again throughout the gospel. And that's why we need this servant God who even serves the indignant one. <laughs> and it, it is something that's just kind of funny is, in their hearts or in, in their words, they probably were like, how dare you ask the Lord this? But in their hearts, they're probably like, you know, how come we didn't ask this first? That was a good idea. Exactly. <laughs> Just like <laughs> our kids would be as well. How did he get to that first? <laughs> Unbelievable. Or of course me as well. But Jesus, the quintessential person of patience, of course he's God, that's who he is, called to them and he speaks about the Gentiles and then he shows how they were to live. Can you break that down for us? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, you know, Jesus and the Gentiles, he's not so much breaking up Gentile verse two here. He's saying, this is, this, this is the world. If John, John quotes Jesus when he talks about the world a lot, this is, 
you know, another word that the T's would have used for the world. It's the world leaders leading is a lording over type process. Um, those who you think are great ones are those who are exercising authority over others, telling others what to do, making sure others do what they're supposed to do. But here, what you're seeing with this kingdom that is coming, a kingdom that you're going to help, you will help usher in, but I'm, I'm the one who's doing the action, is it's, just, it's upside down. I've come to serve. I've, I've come... Again, it, we don't get it in this gospel, the washing of the feet, but this is this is God who comes, and I, I mean, it's so strange to actually not just have a have a human leader, but God Himself willing to kneel before His subjects in order to care for them. It it's an upside down thinking, which they're not going to get until, frankly, I, I, I would guess, you know, Pentecost when the Spirit comes and kind of opens up their hearts and minds to what has taken place. And here, it really comes down to this idea of servanthood and, and, and then also talks about being a slave. First, speaking about how it is supposed to be among us, but then pointing to himself. Why, why is it important for us that we see Jesus as a servant and then what does that mean for us, uh, even for today? Well, as, as, I mean, that's the theme of, 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 well, it's the theme of all the Gospels, but we see this a lot in Matthew. It's the answer to the question, you know, who then can be saved? With man, it's impossible. But with God, as the servant, as the one accomplishing the salvation, as the one bringing the salvation, I mean, we, we even know that... We, we can fool ourselves when we talk about by faith I'm saved as though that faith is my own doing. The only reason I have faith that it's connected to my salvation is because God served me in giving it to me. Uh, he is the one who gives me the faith. He's the one who gives me the spirit. He's the one who gives me a you know, sanctified life. He's the one who promises to bring the good work that he began to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is he is the actor in the story. It's a scriptural story. Uh, it's so it's tempting to read the scriptural story from I guess an anthropocentric point of view where it's where the humans are the actors and they mess up and they mess up and they mess up. Well that that refrain never ends even to this day. But if we look at Scripture as this is the action of a God who is serving people from beginning to end, then we can understand why we have a God that we can actually trust. And uh, again, loving, I, I love translating the word, the Greek word is pistis, which often gets translated as belief in Scripture. But it's also it's not the belief in the sense of, you know, a set of beliefs, but it's a word that really means trust. I can trust someone who is serving me more than I can believe in a master who is lording over me, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, and I like how it, Jesus culminates this. By not just saying, I came to serve, um, but he ends with the ultimate service, which is to give his life as a ransom for many. Pastor, in your work in the city, uh, at your congregation, in the school, but also it, with faith and work enterprises, why is it so important that we see the ultimate service of our Lord as giving his life for us when you serve those in your community? Well, this, I'm, this is this is the Christ that he doesn't. Um, he's not judging folks according to their worthiness. Um, he's not looking for payment um, according to what people can pay. You know, it's different. 
people, depending on their experiences, you know, their lives look different on the outside. Uh, but in the inside, each one of us is broken. And I just had a guy uh, yesterday, um, gosh, down his story, you know, his parents had died, his sibling had committed suicide. He'd been locked up for a long time. And um, I asked him, does that draw you closer to the church or further away from the church? And he said, further away, because he said, I said, why? He said, because he says that the church is full of, of, of people who got their lives together, who, who seem to have things right, and I, I don't fit in. I said, I said that's, that's, that's just outfits that they wear <laughs> underneath all the outfits. And we, we all need help. We all look exactly the same. Your story is our story. Um, we, we need someone to do it for us. And Christ gives up his life. He takes on, you know, it's, that Ash Wednesday, he takes on our ashes in death so that he might give to us his eternal life. That's what I need. And when I know that that's what he does, then it doesn't. But then I look at the rest of created humanity. I, I, I'm able to see them, God willing, with the eyes of Jesus and say, man, he's done this. He's done this for everyone. Uh, if it's, if it's human flesh, he's taking that on because he desires to give that uh, life, which is eternal. So, Pastor, as we before we get to the healing of the two blind men, you've captured the essence of what the gospel, what Jesus is, is given the gospel to these folks. At the same time, we see this servant, um, servant, our servanthood of Jesus play out in the next few verses. But I want to make sure: is there anything else you want to highlight? Verses twenty through twenty-eight. Yeah, I, I, I guess the, the the one other thing is to recognize that those who've been baptized into Christ have Christ in them, and so that Christ who serves us and the world is in us, you know, and 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 doing and pushing for the same thing. And I I feel that sometimes we, whenever we are not in that servant mode, we're fighting against the spirit of Jesus that is, that is in us because that's, that's what he does. And so when we're no longer fighting, then we find the joy of joining Jesus in this work toward others. And what a joy it is. Let's continue on verses 29. And I think we'll just go through the rest to verse 34, because like you said, at the beginning, there's a lot of gems, even though there's not that many verses. Verse 29. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping Jesus called them and said, What do you want for me to do? What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus in pity touched their eyes, and immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Now, Pastor, verse 30, uh, Dr. Gibbs talks about this, and I, it keeps popping out to me in the book of Matthew. You know, they went out of Jericho. There's a great crowd that followed them and behold, and you see that all the time in Matthew where it's like, oh, you know, perk up your ears, perk up your eyes. Something is about to happen because this is not normal. This kingdom is about to reveal itself in a way that's different than the normal kingdom. Any thoughts on, on that word? And, and, then, and then how do you want to start us off in the healing of the two blind men? Yeah, it's like, it's like the pay attention word. Okay. <laughs> Come on, guys, you know, li li listen up, uh, you know, especially in light of, you know, what, what has taken place. Uh, you know, so we have this situation that takes place and we got the mom and her, and her kids and we've got the other 10 who are upset. And then all of a sudden it's, it's almost as like, um, we would say, wow, God works in mysterious ways because all of a sudden this happened. Uh, behold, it's not so mysterious. God is now kind of showing, I, I see this as God is kind of showing a, a corrective for 
what just took place, even though the story stands on its own. Uh, but I love looking at this in light of what we just heard because there are some good parallels going on. One, so we're, we're, we're making our way out of Jericho. We're going toward where Jesus had just foretold that they were going for the kingdom to come in Jerusalem. And uh, behold, pay attention, two blind men sitting by the road. And we just had two what? Two sons who, you know, mom just said, say that these two sons of mine are to do this. Well, now we've got two again, which is interesting in Matthew because we don't get that in uh, the other gospel where it just mentioned Artemis. Uh, Matthew has a way of, of making of showing us that there may be two rather than one in a few different places. Uh, I think it also does it with the uh, um, demon possessed man, that there are, that there are two, uh, that Matthew mentioned. So Matthew points out two uh, by the roadside, similar to the two sons. And here they've got to cry to the Lord, kind of like the, the mother did in some way. Look, I've got something, but, but their cry is much more simple. It's, it's the classic cry of a sinner, a uh, classic cry of someone who does not have anything to offer. Um, it's not a, what must I do? It's not a, a do I have enough or who is my neighbor? It's a Lord, uh, Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy uh, on us. That's, that's all I've got is my asking for you to do it. Interesting, uh, one of the places where he's called the son of David, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't show up tons in the Gospels either. I uh, wonder how these blind men knew to call him son of David. Uh, makes you wonder kind of as a side note, did, were there rumors around that he had been born from Bethlehem? And so some people really did see him as the line of David, while others saw him as you know, just Jesus of Nazareth. But it's also very apropos because he's being called son of David on his journey to Jerusalem where, you know, Palm Sunday, he gets proclaimed, uh, you know, son of David, the king who's coming uh, on, on the donkey. Hmm. Verse 31, the crowd rebukes them as that should hearken us back to both the uh, indignation of the ten, uh, but also back to uh, back to the little the little children come, you know, when they were coming, and, and the disciples were rebuking the people. Oh, well, here we go again, helpless, nothing to offer. Guys by the side of the road get rebuked for messing with the coming kingdom. Come on, we're we're on kingdom business. We're on our way to Jerusalem to to to, to make this new thing happen, uh, but. They uh, cried out all the more. And what, what faith that was, when they're told to be silent, uh, they cry out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us. Verse 32, stopping, Jesus calls them, and what does he do? He says the same thing that he said to the mother of James and John. What do you want? And uh, it's so beautiful when you, you connect it to uh, with, with a mom. Well, I'll tell you what I want. Um, but here's the corrective story that, that moves us toward grace. Lord, have mercy. What do you want? Lord, let our eyes be opened. And, uh, of course, you know, there's two blind men, and, and we're thinking about their, their physical sight. But when we put those words into um, the work of the Spirit, we know that this is this is what God would have all of us pray. Uh, Lord, just let me see. Let me understand. Um, we just finished the Epiphany season, which is a season of revealing um, light and darkness. Uh, darkness is bad just because I don't know what's going on. Bring me the light so that I can see what's really going on. When my eyes are opened, I can see that wow, God is a servant God who has come to do what needs to be done 
for me. And then verse 34, and this is, this is, this is a fun one. If we hearken back earlier in Matthew, earlier in Matthew, there are two blind men, um, who also have the same cry. Now, some people may say, you know, they're, they're very similar stories. This is, uh, Matthew nine twenty seven. Uh, Jesus passed by two blind men followed, uh, crying out, have mercy on a son of David, same thing. Um, and uh, Jesus, uh, when they entered the blind men came, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said, yes, Lord. And according to your faith, it's done. Mm-hmm. And then verse 31, after all, their eyes are open. Jesus warns them, you know, not to tell anyone about this. And then they went away. Um, but here, as these guys pray that their eyes be opened, what becomes interesting is that um, they recovered their sight and they followed him. And that becomes so important as, as we're at this point in the gospel, about ready to go into Jerusalem, is that as their eyes are opened, they're, they're moved to follow Christ and to go with them in this kingdom bringing movement as they now make their way to Jerusalem and probably are, you know, up, up front, you know, proclaiming the Hosannas. This is the son of David, even if they too don't exactly understand that by the end of the week, you know, he's going to take the throne by going on the cross. Right. All the connection of Matthew chapter nine verses 27 through 31, which I did not catch us when I was studying. Of course, it's the exact same title, you know, from it, but the, but the very, very uh, unique differences to this, according to ours is Matthew 20, 29 through 34. That is fascinating. And I want to ask you uh, if there's more to it. In chapter nine, they went away. His fame spread, yeah. but here they they follow. They follow. And, and, and in this one too, Matthew emphasizes, and Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight. Once again, showing that this servant Jesus had compassion on his people, which we also see throughout the gospel of Matthew. But is there, is there, I mean, maybe, maybe you said, I, I, to be honest, I've been going back and forth with these texts as you've been talking, is that they go away, but now they're following. Did you make a distinction on that? Anything for us to, to chew on with that? difference you know what if you if you want to wrestle with it and again we're, we're we're going into you know why why did why did these two go away and these two follow right the the fun part is that it, if you go to the text in matthew 9 jesus he touched their eyes verse 29 saying this he said according to your faith be it done to you and that's great and that's wonderful and you know their eyes were opened and then they went away. Here, Jesus isn't saying according to your faith. It's almost as though um, our faith isn't going to be big enough to do it all. Here, Jesus kind of gives the whole thing, um, and it's pity to touch their eyes, and they recover their sight. And because it's not according to their faith, it wouldn't be enough, he created the faith through the healing that then allowed them to follow him. That's, that's the kind of healing that I need, by the way. If I get healed only according to my faith, it's not going to be the healing I need. I need the healing that actually helps my faith grow, um, that I may, that I may follow him. He does what he does to create the faith rather than waiting for us to have the faith in order to, to respond to it. And that's a a great reminder for us when it comes to faith, that faith is received by the grace of God. And we see this throughout the petitions of the small catechism, where it basically, we are continually praying that, um, that his name be holy, that his kingdom may come, that his will might be done. And we're praying these things, not because God can't do it, but we need it in our lives on a daily basis. Like you said, if he's going to wait around for the faith, to get this done, well, he's going to be waiting, well, probably forever um, for that to happen. But yeah. by his grace, 
he does give it. Now, I do find it interesting here too, Pastor. I want to hear your thoughts. They talk about have mercy on us twice, and you talked about the the Kyrie in that realm and how we as as Lutherans will gather and, and many Christians will gather and do what's called a Kyrie, and that's kind of all we got when we come before the Lord. Why is that important for us to remember these words, Lord, have mercy on us? Yeah, because it, I mean, it really does point to um, who the giver is. It can be so tempting for us to pretend that we are the giver, that we have something to offer, uh, that we have um, something to present to the Lord. Um, and oh, it can be it could be any any number of things. I've had a good week. Uh, I've been faithful. I've been I've gone to church for all of my life. I've been a Lutheran forever. I've done all these things as though that is something to offer before the Lord. And it just it curious on Lord have mercy kind of puts all that aside and says, I don't have anything that's worthy of 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 offering to you, Lord. And so I'm just going to seek you according to your mercy. David used that in, in Psalm 51. He says, you know, according, according to your mercy, according to your namesake, according to your uh, everlasting love, do these things. Not according to me. It's, it's, it's not, it's not going to be enough. Lord have mercy. Which has helped me to understand the importance of the one offering that is appropriate for us as followers of Christ. And that's the offering of thanksgiving, which is really a non-offering. It's, it's the offering of thanks because of what you've given, uh, rather than giving you something so that I can get something. It's, it's a responsive offering uh, rather than an action that I can kind of use to, to, to make you treating God like a, like a vending machine. I'll give you the offering so that I can get something out. Lord have mercy. And now all I can offer is an offering of Thanksgiving. And that in itself is more than enough. There's an interesting difference. Like you said, this is the corrective of the mother's request and a faith request. I guess you would maybe something along those lines where the mother asked for a place in the kingdom, a place of honor. And these uh, two blind men ask twice for mercy and knowing that the Lord is merciful. So what do you want? You know, same question you asked for the, to the mother and knowing that the Lord is merciful. They didn't ask for money. They didn't ask for a place. They simply asked that their eyes be opened, which there had, there was a faith aspect to that too, like that filled them that not only that they may see the world, but also that they may see the Christ. Any, any, but we have about, Two and a half minutes left in our time, Pastor. Um, any last thoughts and encouragement to our listeners by these wonderful words from Scripture? Uh, yeah, I, I, I think it goes. It just goes back time and time, time again to trusting in a God who is serving us. I mean, it, it it can't be said enough uh, because the forever temptation is to look in the mirror and feel like I, I need to bring something. And time and time again, Jesus shows us what, what are you, what are you able to bring? Um, trust in me, trust in me, trust in me. Uh, so we cry with the words that our Lord has taught us. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy, but we do so not wondering, but with the full assurance that the answer is always yes. Pastor Martin Schulteis of Emmanuel Lutheran Church in Baltimore, Maryland, and Executive Director of Faith and Work Enterprises, also in Baltimore, Maryland, giving us God's strong word from Matthew chapter 20. Pastor Schulteis, thank you for bringing us his gifts. Thanks for the thanks for the honor and God blessings to everyone during their Lenten season as our Lord not only invites us to go with him to the cross, but assures us that, that he is with us during this season and every season of our lives. 
I'm your host, Brady Finner, and pastor of Messiah Lutheran Church in Sartell, Minnesota. Thank you for joining us, and the Lord keep you safe in the palm of his hand.